Asato ma sadgamaya Tamaso ma jyotirgamaya Mrityur ma amritam gamaya Om shanti 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 Om lead us from the unreal to the real Lead us from darkness unto light Lead us from death to immortality. Om, peace, peace, peace. Good morning and namaste everybody. Uh, welcome to the second session of our retreat exploring various traditions of meditation. Dhyana, the Sanskrit word meaning meditation. You see, this question about many different techniques. Why are we doing this? One monk in Uttarakhand put, put our situation this way. He says, our condition is like we have been thrown into jail. So samsara is jail. Yeah, we, are, we have been thrown in here. And not just in jail. In jail, there's a worse thing, solitary confinement. So we are in solitary confinement in this little cell of flesh and blood and bone. And all the spiritual paths are paths to freedom. Freedom is our true nature, which is beyond this confinement of samsara, beyond this confinement of body-mind. And that true nature, you can think of it as God, attainment of God, God-realization. Or you can think of it as our own true nature, what we truly are, attainment of that or realization of that. That is freedom. Now, there is a thing to be known about this, that there is a way. The Buddha not only said that there is suffering and said that there is an end to suffering and the suffering and a cause of suffering and an end to suffering, those are the first three noble truths. But he also said there is a way, there is a technique, there is a way of attaining this. Uh, it's not haphazard, it's not arbitrary, it's not random. So, this monk who was saying that they compare in samsara to jail and uh, our bodily confinement to solitary confinement, he said, on your way back home, when you escape from jail or you're released from jail, on your way back home, there are places to rest. There is something, you don't straight away reach home. There is something you rest in. Um, these philosophies, these uh, methodologies, these are what free us from samsara. Remember, what, where you rest in, that is neither the jail nor your ultimate destination. These methods are not samsara, nor are they attainment or liberation. They are methods, they are resting places, they are not our goal. Do not give overwhelming importance to these methods. Sri Ramakrishna put it even better. He said they are paths. In Bengali he said, Joto moth, toto path. As many faiths, so many paths. As many, moth literally means opinion or philosophy or worldview. In fact, worldview is very good. As many worldviews, all of those, spiritual worldviews, all of those are paths to liberation, to freedom, to God-realization, to self-realization. He further says, oh. moth, path. He says, as many faiths, so many paths. The, the path itself is not overwhelmingly important, but it is not unimportant either. You have to hold on to one sincerely, and that will take you there. So that's why we have this workshop, this, um, this retreat on, the Ved, on several paths, each distinct from the other, and yet there is something deep, commonalities there. Do not give too much importance to the technique or the method. Uh, the goal is important, but the method is also important because this is, at present, until we are enlightened, 
until God becomes a reality for us, until the realization I am Brahman, or more um, contextually today, I am Shiva, that becomes a reality, until that becomes, we can honestly say, that is real. Until that point, these faiths, these methods, these um, philosophies, they are our refuge. If we do not hold on to them, we'll slip back into jail, into, into, into samsara again. So until enlightenment, we have to hold on to this, to this, this structure which has been set up. That, that is the importance. So you, you see, it is not the goal, it is not our destination, and yet it is not unimportant. Right now, this is the only thing that saves us from samsara. Don't hold on to a spiritual path, any spiritual path. Slip back into samsara. Uh, immediately. Samsara is all around us. <laughs> it will immediately grab us once we let go of the spiritual path. Today's path. What are we going to explore today? Kashmiri Shaivism. A vast tradition. The way I was introduced to it was um, about 20 years ago. Um, Swami Tadananda, Niranjan Maharaj, whom you saw, who came from Fiji, now he's the head of our ashram in New Zealand. Uh, he was a senior brahmachari, he had just come back from the training center after uh, his studies, and he told me about this amazing philosophy, new means he had newly discovered it, it's of course very old, um, and he said, you should study this, you'll forget your Advaita. Uh, even back then I was known as a, a bit of an Advaita fanatic. So you'll, you should look at this. And he introduced me to some of those books. So that was my first introduction. Few years after that, in the Institute of Culture in Calcutta, at, at one seminar, Professor Arindam Chakravarti, who was here, who gave talks um, at the Vedanta Society, he was uh, participating in the seminar and he told me over tea, you know Swami, I wasn't a Swami, I was a Brahmacharya at that time, you know Maharaj, if you want to understand the gospel of Sri Ramakrishna, Kathamrita, the gospel of Sri Ramakrishna better, uh, more than Advaita of Shankara, you should explore Kashmiri Shaivism. That is a much better fit with Sri Ramakrishna's spiritual realizations and teachings uh, than your Advaita Vedanta. So I got very good recommendations, advertisements. So when I went into the training center, I found all these books and started studying them. I studied mostly by myself. I met one very great scholar of Kashmiri Shaivism, Dr. Devabrata Sen Sharma, who is sadly no more. Um, and so I have had an interest in this. Um, recently, thanks to the strange side effects of the pandemic, I was able to attend uh, online classes with Professor Arindam Chakravarti studying one of the texts of Kashmiri Shaivism, Abhinava Gupta's Ishwara Pratyabhigya Vimarshini. So that's how I came into uh, contact with this tradition. Vast tradition, very ancient. Uh, at least 1200 years ago, we get this whole range of philosophers and texts. It's older than that, but historically, we can date it back to at least 1200, 1300 years ago. Kashmir has been very, very important in our uh, spiritual history, in the spiritual history of India. Shankaracharya went there. He is said to have attained to the seat of omniscience, Sarvagya Pita. Uh, he had long discussions with philosophers in Kashmir. Ramanuja Acharya went there, the uh, great master of Vishishta Dvaita Vedanta. Ramanuja Acharya. He went there in search of a text. The libraries were renowned. So, the famous, famed Bodhayana Vritti, which is a commentary on the Brahma Sutras, Ramanuja went to Kashmir to search for it. That's a separate story. <coughs> Interesting. The famous philosophers, Kshema Raja, Utpaladeva and others, Abhinava Gupta, by far, head and shoulders above the, whole, the rest of them, perhaps one of the greatest philosophers, saints, that India has produced. A polymath, a multiple... Uh, you know, we talk about multiple talents, genius in many fields, in literature, in, in, uh, in aesthetics, in philosophy, in, in spiritual life, in many ways, who lived less than a thousand years ago, actually. Among the texts, the most important one is Shiva Sutras. There are others, um, the Spandakarika, the uh, Pratyabhigya Hridayam, uh, the 
Tantra Loka, and this book, which we shall use today, the Vigyana Bhairava, the Vigyana Bhairava. A background is necessary before we go into the technique which we are going to talk about today. Um, a philosophical background is necessary. Uh, what is this all about? I'll put it in one sentence and then expound on it. You are Shiva. I am Shiva. Again, everybody is Shiva. Shiva is the ultimate reality of this universe. So, I am Shiva. This is the central teaching of um, Kashmiri Shaivism. Uh, we have forgotten it. We do not know it. We have to realize it. Not knowing it, suffering, samsara, jail. Realizing it is freedom. Um, the nature of realization in Kashmiri Shaivism is recognition is recognition. What happens at realization is something like recognition. Notice the very interesting thing about recognizing somebody. It's neither just seeing, nor is it just memory. And you say, I remember somebody. You are not seeing that person, you are remembering the person whom you had seen many, many years ago. When you say, I see somebody, I see uh, a person, my friend, uh, you are seeing that pers person, you are not remembering. But when you say, I recognize him, you are that person. Two things are happening. You are seeing this person right now and also recalling, oh, you are this person I saw 10 years ago. So memory is there and seeing is there. Just memory, there is no seeing there. Just seeing, there is no memory there. But in recognition, both memory and seeing are there. If that is clear, then enlightenment is like recognition. You actually have an experience of your own Shiva nature and you recognize it. You, you remembered all the teachings and you apply it there and you see, this is what I really am. I always knew it. It was always my nature. Now I realize this. Shiva recognizes Shiva. Jiva recognizes, Jiva means the individual sentient being, recognizes itself as Shiva. But it's basically Shiva, Shiva alone. So this is the basic idea. The technical term for this enlightenment as recognition is Pratyabhigya. Pratyabhigya. It's a complicated Sanskrit word. Uh, it is memory and seeing together. Pratyabhigya. That's why this philosophy is called Pratyabhigya philosophy. This whole philosophy is called Pratyabhigya philosophy. Vast number of texts, many, many practitioners. It is, it is uh, uh, I mean, as we go on, you will see many similarities between Sri Ramakrishna's teachings and uh, Kashmiri Shaivism. Though we um, do not know if he ever met any Kashmiri Shaiva practitioner, but he did practice and meet great tantric practitioners. And Kashmiri Shaivism has a great affinity. It's in fact like a cousin to the Tantra schools. A good story here is, um, it's like um, uh, the story I tell about, you know, God creating everything and forgetting himself. So the Kashmiri Shaiva view, worldview is that Shiva alone, Shiva was probably uh, bored and wanted to have fun, was not bored, but the very Leela, the joy of Shiva is to expand and manifest himself as this universe and as us. The limit of Shiva's expansion and manifestation as this universe is up to matter and energy, time and space, this physical universe, material universe. This is the outermost expansion of Shiva. And here are we, Shiva alone, but now with bodies and minds in this physical form. So this is the outermost, the expansion of, uh, of the Shiva nature. But this expansion is also a contraction. What kind of contraction? Contraction of the glory, the divine nature of Shiva is hidden, contracted as it were. Uh, so the Jiva, under bondage, Shiva is called Jiva. Freedom, the Jiva is called Shiva. Pash Baddho Jeev, Pash Mukto Shiv. Under bondage, the same entity is called Jiva. Freed from those bondages, the same entity is called Shiva. 
So Shiva appearing as this universe and as us has forgotten himself. So the glory of Shiva, uh, the omniscience, the blissful nature, the infinite being that is hidden and we become little beings, uh, not infinite, subject to birth and death. We are born and we age and we uh, bodies degenerate and we die. Uh, our thoughts are feeble, our knowledge is limited. This is the, the limitation of the Shiva nature. The most, the biggest problem, the, pro, the, the essential problem is that we do not know ourselves as Shiva. And the whole spiritual journey is Shiva now rediscovering his own nature or Jiva discovering its own nature as Shiva. So that's the whole spiritual journey. There's another Kashmiri um, Shaiva story of um, the headless man. There was a man who was a great devotee of Shiva, who meditated on Shiva and repeated the mantra, you know, Om Namah Shivaya, day in and day out, was unable to get a vision of Shiva. One day in the dream, Shiva came and the man prayed, Lord, why do I not get a vision? Um, why, why can't I see you? And Shiva said, all right, you'll see me tomorrow. All right, where do I look? Look for the headless man. Look for the headless man, that will be me. The next morning, this man started looking, but everybody has a head. He kept on looking. And hours and hours, he couldn't find any headless person until suddenly he chanced upon his own body and looked. Oh, no head. Here is the headless man. I am Shiva, Shivoham. And he realized himself as Shiva. So the, those are the stories which talk about the essential message of Kashmiri Shaivism. But it's a... It's a vast philosophy, and the philosophy is essential for the meditation technique. It's very complicated. Advaita Vedanta is very simple compared to Kashmir Shaivism. Um, you know, Ayan Maharaj, Swami Medhananda, the Ayan who had come here, the young scholar monk, he calls this a Baroque philosophy. Baroque, you know, Baroque art, very intricate work. So there is a tremendous amount of intricacy here. We'll just skim the surface and know just enough for our purposes. Shiva. What is Shiva? The ultimate nature of Shiva is pure consciousness, infinite existence, and infinite bliss. Sounds like Advaita. You're right and wrong. There is a distinction between Kashmiri Shaivism and Advaita Vedanta. Um, both are non-dualities. We'll see what that means. But Kashmiri Shaivism says the Shiva nature, in addition to its infinite existence, infinite consciousness, infinite bliss, is also self-aware. It is not only light, but it is also a reflection. It, it is aware of itself. The difference is a crucial difference. In Sanskrit, this is called prakasha vimarsha. Prakasha means light. But the light which is aware of itself, it's not only aware of the entire universe, which it has projected, but it's also aware of its own, own existence. In Advaita Vedanta, this is not admitted. In Advaita Vedanta, you would say the ultimate reality, you, Brahman, are light. Consciousness, that's it. Self-awareness, that begins only when the mind starts functioning. And they said that consciousness alone, with through Maya, has projected this entire universe, including body and mind. And in the mind, you become aware of your, you, you start thinking, yes, I am this person. Yeah. Or even, I am Brahman, that's also the mind and ultimately not real. This unlimited awareness alone is real. Kashmiri Shaiva says this is practically useless unless you are infinite and aware of your infinitude. Where's the fun? So it's a philosophy of fun. Uh, Shiva is having fun in this universe and recognizing his own nature, that is also fun. Uh, so Vimarsha, self-aware. Uh, so it's like not only I have a face, but I also have a mirror, and I'm, I'm aware of my own face in the mirror. That part, Advaita Vedanta would dismiss as Maya appearance. Kashmiri Shaivism says that's an integral part of reality. Without that, it says you cannot explain the universe. And this Vimarsha, this is the power of consciousness called Shakti. So in Kashmiri Shaivism, Shiva and Shakti are both ultimately real. Shiva and Shakti are both real. Shiva is the consciousness and Shakti is the power of consciousness. First of all, Vimarsha. 
by which consciousness is aware of itself. And indivisibly they're together, Shiva and Shakti. Now, this consciousness and vimarsha, this self-awareness, has three powers, further powers. It, uh, jnana, knowledge, the ability to know. Not only is it aware of itself, it is aware of everything. Ability to desire, ichcha, and ability to act, kriya. All of which Advaita Vedanta would say, oh, that's maya and after maya. Um, Kashmiri Shaivism says they are real. The uh, ability to know, to desire, and to uh, will, to do. Those are powers of Shiva, but down to us, we all have those powers. Only in the case of unfortunate creatures like us, Jiva, all those powers are very feeble. We have knowledge, but our knowledge is of material reality. We see things, hear, smell, taste, touch. We think and remember, that's our knowledge. A dualistic kind of knowledge, very limited. We see the universe slice by slice, little by little only. Shiva's knowledge the, uh, is omniscient, knows everything, all of it, including his own nature, all at once and all the time, without limit. Icha, our desires are very feeble and they are about material things. We want little pleasures, little satisfaction, that much, and our capacity is very limited. Shiva's desire is this entire universe, uh, the, the sport. It's a very pure desire, bliss, to manifest this bliss as this universe. Icha. And Kriya, the ability to act, the willpower, to convert our knowledge and desire into action. We, have, we are very feeble. Only physically, we can only control this body, this speech, and a little bit of the mind. That's our limit of our capacity, even at best. And that's also for some time. Every night also we lose it. So, very limited Kriya Shakti. Shiva's Kriya Shakti is infinite. In a flash, Shiva manifests this entire universe. So, infinite power of knowledge, desire, and the ability to fulfill that desire, Kriya. Jnana, Icha, Kriya, to an unlimited extent. That is the Trishula. Shiva is always depicted with a trident. So the trident are these three powers. So you'll see a lot of what is there in iconography, in mythology, it's all explained. The inner meaning is there in Kashmir Shaivism. Now, Shiva expanding to its limit becomes Jiva and uh, is bound. Not Jiva not knowing itself is bound. Jiva knowing itself becomes Shiva. Um, so these three, Shiva, Shakti, and Nara. Nara means human being, but Nara means Jiva. All, all sentient beings are called Nara. The Nara, literally in Sanskrit it means human, but here it means all sentient beings, all beings who are, who are originally Shiva. These three together are the main points, the, the central themes of Kashmiri Shaivism. Shiva, Shakti, and Nara. That's why these three Together, they are, this philosophy is another name for the philosophy is Trika. Three, the triadic philosophy. Trika. Not trick. Trika, Sanskrit word Trika. Philosophy with a triad. Okay. Uh, Shiva, Shakti, Nara. He was asking what's the third one? Shiva, Shakti, Nara. N A R A. Uh, Nara, human, or Jiva, sentient being. So, why sentient being? If Shiva is the ultimate reality, why bring in the sentient being? Because we have to begin where we are. We find ourselves in this material world as this person. I understand you want to show that the, all of this is Shiva, but we have to begin at my level. My level is that of an individual being. See, uh, just a philosophical note here. About which applies to all the philosophies that we are practicing, uh, that, that we are, the methods of, of um, meditation, the philosophies which are the basis of the methods of meditation. All our experience is of subject and object. Drik drishya. I am the seer, and this is seen. Seen means seen, heard, smelt, tasted, touched. Thought about, desired, hated, 
all of that, subject, object. That's what it is. All our life is this. Now, look at how these philosophies act. The devotee, the one who believes in God, puts the ultimate reality on the side of the drishya, the objective universe. Here is this vast universe. And behind this vast universe, there must be a power who created this universe, who sustains this universe, including us, who protects all of us, and ultimately dissolves it back into itself. That power, I call it God. But remember, it's that for me, that reality. Could be in heaven, could be within us, could be what, whatever, um, transcendent and immanent God. So I am the subject, and the ultimate reality is the object, which I'm trying to realize. Note what will happen here. As I try to become one with God through devotion and prayer and meditation, a little bit of a difference is bound to remain in principle because whatever is God will appear to me the consciousness. I, the consciousness, will have to remain if I have to experience God. So that difference between devotee and God will remain. This path is dualistic through and through. Beginning dualistic, end also will be dualistic and no harm there because that's what the devotee wants. The devotee does not want to become Sugar wants to taste sugar. Sri Ramakrishna asked Narendranath uh, that if you are, it's a bowl of nectar, and if you are a bee, uh, want to sip the nectar, would you sip, sit on the edge and sip the nectar, or would you dive into it? He said, I, I'll sit on the edge and sip it, I'll enjoy it that way. If I dive into it, I might die. And Sri Ramakrishna said, but this is the nectar of immortality. Uh, so if you jump into it, you don't die. You can sit on the edge and sip, and that is joy. You experience the pure joy of devotion. The other way is to put the ultimate reality into the subject. Remember, structure of experience, subject, object. Put the ultimate reality as the subject. That is the way of Sankhya and Yoga, where the ob we are too much engrossed in the objective universe if we can turn away from the objective universe into the subject. Discard the objective universe. In meditation, dive into the subject. In samadhi, erase the experience of the universe. And then we realize the self. Our own self is the ultimate reality. So you're putting the ultimate reality on the subject side. Drik is the ultimate reality. But you cut away. The external universe still remains unresolved as a separate material universe. The problem with this is the, you set up a tension between the internal and external, between spirituality and the world. One sadhu put it this way, ghare ka drashta to ghare se nyara hai hi. It is true that the seer of the pot is distinct from the pot. I keep talking about drik drishya viveka, seer and seen. So that is true. But if you hold on to that and that is your entire philosophy, uh, that Sadhu put it humorously, I'll explain in Hindi and then in English. He said, Aakhir mein wo ghare ka dushman ban jata hai. <laughs> that he becomes an enemy of the pot. Enemy of the pot means the pot is the universe. So you will see, in most monastic traditions, it's a rejection of the world. It's a stepping away from the world, non-involvement with the world. It's bad, it's to be discarded, and I have to withdraw which is fine, but it's not, not of much use of people involved in the world. The solution to this is in non-duality, where what you see outside and what you see inside, with the God you find in the world outside and the reality you find in the subject inside, Drik and Drishya, they are one and the same reality. Now you might ask, what about yesterday Buddhist? What is the Buddhist approach? The Buddhist approach is to concentrate on the experience itself. I am the subject, here is the object, but between the two, what is there? Experience. Here is a clock, I am, here is the I, subject, object, but in between is the experience of seeing. What the Buddhist approach is, to oversimplify, is to concentrate on the relationship between subject and object, and thereby discover to make the subject empty and the object empty and thereby free yourself. 
to repeat that, what the Buddhist does is focus on the relationship between subject and object. Breathing is a good way to do that. And then you realize the breath itself is empty and the breather also is empty. <laughs> and you are freed of uh, bondage. You need not talk about an ultimate reality or anything like that. So you have these approaches. Subject-object structure, which is given for us. That's how we experience the world. Put the ultimate reality, God, as the object. Dualistic devotion. That's one way. The afternoon session, we will see how meditation, a very rich meditative session on dualistic devotion, we'll see in the afternoon session. Another way is the Sankhya Yoga way. You put the ultimate reality on the subject side and try to discover who am I. And the Buddhist is the relationship between subject and object. Dissolving subject, dissolving object, and you're free. What Advaita Vedanta and Kashmiri Shaivism does is different. It says subject, object, experience of subject and object, the whole thing is an appearance of an underlying ultimate reality. It is Shiva alone, Brahman alone, who appears as you the knower, the known object, and your experience of knowing. Seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, I the eater and the food that is eaten and the act of eating is Brahman. Does it remind you of something? <laughs> Brahma, Pranama. I won't repeat the whole, uh, we will become hungry otherwise. <laughs> that is the Advaitic approach and that is the Kashmiri Shaiva approach also. It's non-dual. Non-dual means it's not a separate thing. Subject and object are not two separate things. Both are actually appearances of one reality. Swami Vivekananda put it very simply. He said, one only exists. It appears as nature, soul. Nature means objective universe. Soul means I the experiencer. One only exists. It appears as nature, soul. Kashmiri Shaivans would say that yes, and that one is our Shiva, not your Brahman. <laughs> One only exists, Shiva alone exists, but they are more radical than non-dualists. What is the problem for uh, non-dualism, for Advaita? We do not know our um, Brahman nature. Ignorance is the problem, and we have to overcome ignorance. We have to hear the teachings and contemplate it, and then meditate upon it, Shravana, Manan, and Nididhyasana. If that sounds familiar, we'll be doing it tomorrow. But the Kashmiri Shaivites are, Shaivites are even more radical. They say that who can obstruct Shiva? It is Shiva's desire to appear as the Jiva right now. And therefore you, the Shiva, you are playing the role of a Jiva. You are acting the role of a, of a Jiva. When you want freedom, no Maya, no ignorance can stop you. Why will Maya or ignorance stop you? Because Maya, here it is Vimarsha, Shakti. It is your power. You have used your power to project a universe and project yourself into this universe as this little creature, as the jiva, as the human sentient being. When you want to um, realize yourself, nothing can stop you. When Shiva wants to realize his Shiva nature, nothing can stop you. Remember, when I say his, it does not mean male. Shiva nature is for all, for all of us. Shiva Shakti is within all of us. And that's how this body-mind functions. Nothing can stop you. The moment you want it, it will be there. Immediately you'll be you, Immediately. Without any, any, any uh, gap of time. We may say, but Swami, I want to realize it now. So why, why am I not realizing it? What's, what's stopping Shiva? Right now, according to the Kashmir Shaivites, you, Shiva is playing the role of a spiritual seeker. Shiva does not want to realize it yet. Shiva wants to sp play the role of a seeker who wants to realize, a sadhaka. A sadhika, a person who is, I want to attend retreats and listen to talks and practice meditation. That's what Shiva wants now, not enlightenment. The moment Shiva wants enlightenment, it will be immediately you will become enlightened. So they are more radical than the <laughs> Advaitins. Okay. They are also more comprehensive. In Kashmiri Shaivism, what are the methods? So there is a broad range of methods, four broad approaches to enlightenment. Remember, in dualistic devotion, devotion, prayer, contemplation, surrender, that is the way. In uh, Buddhistic meditation, 
We saw yesterday following the breath and staying there with it. It's a practice, keeping the mind focused on that. In Advaita Vedanta, it will be study of the Upanishads, listening to the teachings and trying to understand it, and then staying with it. What is it in Kashmiri Shaivism? Four broad approaches. It's a vast, again, a, um, a huge area of, of study and practice. Four approaches. Approaches, the ways are called upaya. Upaya means method. Upaya means method. For a Kashmiri Shaivite, what we are doing in this retreat, yesterday, today, tomorrow, and day after, they're all upayas. You're all dealing with upayas. And again and again, we are told, remember, upaya is not Shiva. Upaya is not Shiva. It's, a, it's something that you hold so that Jiva can realize itself as Shiva. It's something, upaya is something that's always temporary. It, you will, uh, it, they give the example of crossing the Ganges. And we see it near Belurmat in, in India. So the Ganga River is flowing. If you want to go to Calcutta, or you want to come from Calcutta, that's a better way. Calcutta is samsara, and Belurmat is, <laughs> is your Shiva nature enlightenment. So if you want to come from samsara to Belurmat, to enlightenment, you take a little boat, a little boat. And you take the boat, it takes you across the river, and then you let the boat go. You don't carry the boat with yourself. I've fallen in love with the boat. I want the boat. No, you don't take it to your room. You let it go at the bank of the river. Upaya is like that. So they have four upayas. I mean, four broad highways, let us say, or four big boats. First is um, anupaya. No path, path. What path is it? No path. Uh, then shambhava upaya. The way of shambhu or shiva. Shambhu is the name of Shiva. Shambhava Upaya, the way of Shiva or Shambhu. Third one is Shakta Upaya, the way of Shakti or the Divine Mother. Shakti or Divine Mother. That's the third one. Fourth one is Arnava Upaya, A-N-V-A. You can put it in English, A-N-V-A, Arnava Upaya. Arnava comes from Anu. Anu means atom, the tiny. Who is the tiny one? Us. Uh, we, in our contracted state, the glories of Shiva have disappeared. We are like tiny atoms. We are not the vast, we are tiny. Arnava Upaya. What are these Upayas? What they hold on to, what they use as a support, that's the, uh, that is the path. So the first one has no support. Uh, anupaya. Anupaya means no Upaya, no path, path. No support. How does that work? It's direct illumination. They say by sh Shakti path, they call it Shakti path, by the infusion of the grace of the Guru. The Guru can awaken. The Guru can awaken. A sufficiently powerful Guru can directly awaken us. Some awaken spontaneously by the grace of Shiva. We know of such examples. Suddenly they awaken into their real nature. Or by the special grace of the Guru, one can awaken. And this we see. In many cases, Sri Ramakrishna did it, especially for Narendra Nath. That is called, that is the Anupaya. First, first awakening, direct. Holy Mother could do that. When she gave initiation, uh, so the powerful gurus, the initiation they give is, is a special initiation, um, a Shambhavi Diksha, they, they, they call it, where directly you are the, the teacher gives the instruction or the mantra and the student gets direct illumination. Holy Mother, when she would initiate, the simple stories, and she would just call the person and give the mantra, and you said, you offer me this. She would even give, the fruit, give the person the fruit, you offer this to me. And now you bow down, here is the mantra, and we say, look, my child, here is your chosen deity. And that person would have a vision of the chosen deity, maybe for the only time in their lives, till their, uh, till their death. So, actual vision of the chosen deity. What should be the end of all the spiritual practices that comes at the first. And then, then you practice trying to, what she has given, you try to make it your own. But that, so that's cool, let's do that. <laughs> but the problem is, it's not in our hands. It may take time, it may be by the grace of Guru, someday it may happen. Mostly it does not happen. You cannot sit around waiting for that to happen because all the time we are in solitary confinement. We want to get out of this miserable existence. 
to, to find freedom from this. So we have to take up whatever paths are available to us. What are the paths available to us? First one, Shambhava Upaya. That's the highest one. No path path is of course the highest, direct, immediate, but if that's not happening, then the Shambhava Upaya. Shambhava comes from Shambhu. Shambhu is the name of Shiva. It is, to put it briefly, it is very much like our, uh, um, like our Advaita Vedanta. By one effort, you try to realize, I am Shiva. So the instruction is given, we shall see. The technique we shall use now is a Shambhava Upaya technique, uh, the one we'll practice. So you try to realize, I am Shiva. Very much like Jnana Yoga. There are distinctions, I'm, I'm oversimplifying here, there are clear distinctions, but it's, it's a lot like the Advaitic, that thou art, tattva masi, you realize that. The, if that does not work, then the Shakta Upaya, there is the Shakta Upaya, the, using the power of Shakti, Divine Mother. Each Upaya, as you go further and further away, uh, further and further, uh, you know, uh, make it more practical, it becomes more comprehensive, more complicated. Many more methods come. So in Shakta Upaya, there are many methods. There you can find mantra, meditation. Meditation comes in Shakta Upaya. There are meditations in Shambhava Upaya also, but Shakta Upaya is a way of mantra. Uh, all the, the 52 letters of the Sanskrit alphabet, starting from A, ending with H. The Sanskrit alphabet is very phonetic. So from the first one is the sound we make when we open our mouths, A. Uh. And the last one, the 52nd, will be H, uh, when it ends. Just the exhalation of breath. Now, all those, those letters, illumined by consciousness, it's not, so in, in Kashmiri Shaivism, everything you have to see, it is a manifestation of Shiva. So there's consciousness plus that manifestation. So the 52 letters illumined by consciousness um, is called Matrika. Matrika, the, the spiritual language, the letters. It is language which traps us in samsara, nama, rupa, fe, and form and name, the labeling. And it is language which will free us. There's a worldly language which traps us in samsara, and there's a divine language which frees us. The divine language is the language of mantras. You will see a lot of us, we have been initiated, and so the theory behind all of our initiation is here. A, first one. Ha is the last one. In between, all the letters are there. So every word is formed from those letters between a uh and her. So every object in the universe, everything in the universe, gross or subtle, it has a name. And the names are formed by these letters. So everything within those a uh and her uh represents the entire universe. Because all the letters are there, all the sounds are there. From those sounds, names are formed, and names refer to objects in the universe. Mantras are constituted by these letters. And they have esoteric significance. Let me show you some fun stuff. One, one interesting thing, I can write it there and show it to you. So the first letter I said was, uh, I'm writing it into Devanagari. It is not A, it is A. And the last one is her. Now, all the letters are in between. But the, what the interesting thing is, if you put these two together, you get a hum. A, her, they'll put a dot here. Aham. See, so? But aham is the Sanskrit for I. Just this I which we use all the time. When we say I, we normally refer to this little creature, body mind, I, aham. Uh -huh. Aham vadami, I am speaking now. This, I, I mean this person, I, Sarva Priyananda, I'm speaking. But what Kashmir Shaivism is telling us is the matrika, if you look at the matrika, your name, I, your name is I. You refer to yourself as I. And everybody's name is I. We all refer to ourselves as I. This I, if you look at the letters, 
All letters are between a and ha. And with all these letters, all names are constituted. And all those names refer to everything in the universe. Your name means the entire universe. Everything that is there in the, your real nature, the whole universe is included. More fun, you see. A, ha. This ha, instead of hung, it means I. Another meaning would be, another way of writing the same thing would be a hun. Hun means to destroy in Sanskrit. A means not, that which cannot be destroyed. So the ahang also means the indestructible, the immortal. <laughs> you are the immortal consciousness, you are this universe, the entire universe is you. That's what you're saying when you say I. It means, so in, in Kashmiri Shaivism, this is called Purnahamta. Purnahamta means our I is the limited ego. Purnahamta is the cosmic I of Shiva. And that is what our goal is. That is our real nature already. We have to realize that. So the way of the Divine Mother, Shakta Upaya, uh, it utilizes mantras. If that also does not work, then you go further down, down to our level, this body and mind. How to sit, how to breathe, what rituals to do, uh, what external symbols to use, our puja, all of our worship that we do is included in the Anva Upaya, the method based on the individual being. And each of these, the Anva Upaya especially, has a lot there is, the mantras are there, yantras, sacred diagrams are there, uh, there, are, there is asana, how to sit, breathing, there is yoga meditation techniques, there is diksha, initiation. All of this is packed into anva upaya, shakta upaya, and at the tip of the spear is the shambhava upaya, the way of Shiva. The other one I'm not, I'm not in bringing into our calculation the anupai because that's no path path that we can't do anything about. So these are the three paths in which all the techniques, the vast variety of methods in Kashmiri Shaivism are given there. All this background is necessary. We haven't started yet. Now I'm going to tell you about the practice, today's practice. So there are many practices in Kashmiri Shaivism broadly divided into these three, Shambhava Upaya, the way of Shiva, Shakta Upaya, the way of the Divine Mother, and um, the Anva Upaya, the way of the Jiva, us. Usually, a practitioner will start off at the Anva Upaya with a variety of external practices, uh, and then progress, go through the higher practices of Shakta Upaya, finally Shambhava Upaya, hopefully the person will get the realization, I am Shiva. Now, um, among the practices, one book is there which is full of these techniques. So that is this book. It is called Vigyana Bhairava. Vigyana Bhairava. Um, this uh, Vig Bhair Vigyana Bhairava. Vigyana means consciousness or Shiva. Bhairava is another name of Shiva. Bhairava is another name of Shiva. The common name of Shiva in India is Bhairava. What it means, let me just write it down. So you'll see in Kashmiri Shaivism, one thing is there, they're full of esoteric meanings. When you look deep inside, everything has very deep meaning. So Bhairava, I'm writing the Sanskrit, and then the English, Bhairava. Three letters are there. Bha, Ra, and Wa. And Wa. So what does it mean? 
Bha means Bharanath in uh, I'll write in English Bharana Bharana means to fill to support that which supports the entire universe right now I'll, I'll explain how um, consciousness imagine it to be a mirror the Kashmiri Shaivas are, are very big on using mirror reflection things they lived in a land of uh, imagine something like Switzerland towering mountains, glaciers, brilliant blue skies, sometimes overcast, and brilliant lakes. So you could see everything, the sky and the mountains reflected in the lakes. So uh, imagine a lake or a mirror. The mirror is consciousness, vijnana, vijnana, uh, this consciousness. That's also the state of bhairava alone, consciousness alone. When it is full of reflections, in the, in the mirror or in the lake, you can see many, many things. Sky, earth, mountains, um, forests, uh, birds flying. Entire universe appears in consciousness. So what's that like? Like this, right now. This is the mirror of consciousness full of the reflections. This is the lake of consciousness where all reflections are appearing. This is the Bhairava consciousness where the entire universe is appearing. This is called the state of Bharana. Bharana means fully supporting the entire universe. Ravana, not Ravana. Ravana. This is an unusual use of the term. I was looking up the Sanskrit dictionary. So the way they use it is that which dissolves the entire universe into which the entire universe dissolves. The mirror is there, is, is what, what into which all the reflections ultimately disappear. When there are no reflections, suppose you take the mirror and point it at the sky. All the, um, you know, only sky will appear. All the buildings and people and all will be gone. Where did they go? They never were in the mirror. They were there, they appeared and they disappeared into the mirror. Whole universe disappears. Imagine only empty blue sky. Or imagine only a mirror without any reflections at all. If you try to see it, you'll be reflected. So don't try to see it. Just the mirror itself without any reflections. So Ravana means where the universe is disappeared into consciousness itself. There's no separate universe, only consciousness. Um, it's a rare use of the term. Multiple meanings are given in the dictionary. The closest I saw would be unsteady or fickle, when the universe becomes unsteady or fickle and disappears back into the uh, reflecting medium. And V is Vamana, projecting. Not Vamana, but Vamana, projecting. So the entire universe is projected. That which projects. So it's a mirror in which all the reflections appear. That which projects the universe, which supports the universe, and which finally dissolves the universe is Bhairava. That's how we understand God. God is the creator, preserver, and destroyer of the universe. That's the inner meaning of Bhairava. Abhinava Gupta, the great commentator, he explains this way. He says the Bha, it means Vishwa Rupata, Shiva appearing, Bhairava appearing as the entire universe. Then uh, Va, he explains as the, the Srashta, the projector of the entire universe. By the way, uh, unpleasant meaning. Va vamana also means puking, throwing up. So you can see they don't consider the universe to be particularly good. <laughs> no, uh, but that's not the meaning they say. The vamana also means projecting uh, outwards. So and Ravana, uh, Abhinavagupta says, prashamana, the the quiescence, the silence of the universe. Consciousness is there. The mirror is there. The lake is there. Suppose in deep darkness. In the lake, in the same alpine or Kashmiri lake, the mountains and the sky and the clouds, the forest, nothing will be reflected. Just the lake in darkness itself. So that's the state of Bhairava. Um, projecting the universe, sustaining the universe, and then again withdrawing the universe into itself. That Bhairava is Shiva, is you, is our real nature. Now, one more thing. When it is in this state right now, Consciousness, whole universe is appearing. You're awake, world is going on, 
things are really happening, good, bad, pleasant, everything is going on. This full state is called bharitakara. Bharitakara means the form of consciousness which is full, full of the universe. It's the, like the empty space, now the entire universe has appeared in that space. This is the, the, the full state of the universe. This bharitakara is also known as bhairavi, the female form of the bhairava, where the power of the Divine Mother is fully manifest here. Samsara is going on and it's, it's tremendous activity, ups and downs, all good things, all bad things, coronavirus, everything is going on at the same time. This is the Bharitakara. Okay. Now one may stay, say here, so if this is the fullest state, the Bharitakara, the state of Bhairavi, um, so we are here, doesn't do us much good, here we are, but we do not see it as Bhairavi. We see it as a physical world, as a physical body, as a limited being who is suffering and with, with small little hopes, little pleasures we are chasing, samsara. That's what we see it as. If you could see it as Bhairavi, that would be that, wonderful, that would be enlightenment. That's what Advaita Vedanta calls Jivan Mukti. So that's a Jivan Mukti of Advaita Vedanta compared to this is a very anemic, colorless kind of state. This is tremendous. You experience the divine in everything at every moment. So that is liberation. Same thing. Another way of putting this, very beautiful. The Bhairava or Shiva has a third eye. In iconography you will find. That's the eye of knowledge. When that is closed, we see this universe as it is, right now, as we are seeing it. When that is open, we are still seeing this universe, but everything is dissolved in the light of Shiva. You realize everything is Shiva. It's just like seeing thousands of waves. You're seeing thousands of waves, but suddenly you see water. When you see water, the same 10,000 waves are not 10,000 anymore. They're really one mass of water. Still you are seeing the waves coming up, playing around and die, but you know it's one mass of water. When the third eye of the Bhairava opens, that is called Bhairava Drishti, the vision of the Bhairava. We had the same experience of the world, the same waking, dreaming, deep sleep, but now it is all Turiya. I'm using Advaitic terms. It's all Turiya. It is the same 10,000 waves, but it's all water. It's the same range of uh, gold uh, ornaments, but it's all gold now. You realize it. What's the difference? The difference is knowledge only. Seeing this way versus seeing that way. And that's the opening of the eye of the Bhairava. All right. We still haven't come to the practice. But now we are ready. So in this book, now we are ready to understand what's, what the practice is. You'll see as I describe the practice, all of this will come together. This book has 112 practices. 112 practices to realize the, the, your Bhairava nature or your Shiva nature, same thing. So what I used, the terms here, Bhairava, Bhairavi, the same thing as Shiva and Shakti, Prakasha, Vimarsha. It all goes back to Prakasha, Vimarsha. Light and self-awareness. Yeah. Abhinava Gupta puts it so beautifully. What is this universe? He says, Prakasha, Prakashate, light is shining. That's all. That's this universe. You are that light which is shining. Prakasha, Prakashate. Which is also aware of itself. Vimarsha, that's the Shakti. Or it's the Bhairava and Bhairavi. 112 practices. These 112 practices are called dharanas. Dharanas, concentrations. Like, like the term used in Patanjali Yoga. Dharana, Dhyana, Samadhi. Focus or concentration. These are spiritual concentrations. 112 are there. We will do the first one. So in this, Bhairavi is teaching, the student is the Divine Mother. She is asking on behalf of all of us. So how do I realize this state? By the way, the Divine Mother, Shakti or Bhairavi is also called Shiva Mukha, the gate to your Shiva nature. So how beautifully it matches. The Divine Mother asked in, when they were in Kashi, in, in Benares, uh, Holy Mother was there, Masharada, Swami Brahmananda was there. So she sent word to Swami Brahmananda. She said, ask him, why should you worship the Divine Mother? 
You want to realize you are Brahman, finished, that's all. Where does the Divine Mother enter the equation? So somebody went and asked, the Holy Mother is, wants you to answer this question, why should one worship the Divine Mother? Uh, he said, because the keys to, the, to enlightenment, Brahma Jnana Chabikati, the keys to the Brahma Jnana, the knowledge of Brahman, realization of Brahman, are in the hands of the Divine Mother. She can confer, she opens the gate to, um, to, to your own Shiva nature. Without that, Samsara, we are caught in the jail of Samsara. She opens the gate of the jail of Samsara and lets us go, go free. So, these are 112 methods. We are going to deal with the first one. It's, that's the most famous one. And that's the only one I personally have actually practiced a little bit, so uh, I can talk about it with some confidence. The first one. It is not unknown to Advaitins. It's the Soham Mantra. Soham, I am that. Literally it means I am he, but he here means that, that Shiva nature. So, sa means that, ham means I. I, aham, sa, aham, soham. But here it's used in a different way. So how is it used? Uh, let me just give you the original verse. It's the 24th verse of this book. Vigyana Bhairava, verse 24 is the first meditation technique. Shri Bhairava Vacha Urdhve prano hyado jivo visargatma parocharet utpatti dvitiya sthane bharanat bharita sthiti. You can hear that. Bharanat, bharita sthiti, the Bhairava terminology being used. That is the fullest expression of the Bhairava, this entire universe which is vibrating with the presence of Shiva. What is that? So uh, I will explain. Divine Mother is that highest, the Paradevi or Parashakti, Visargatma, who, who produces, who projects this entire universe. Uh, by, and, and the vibration of that is felt in our breathing. How do we do that? So there, it's the indication of the technique. Back to the breath. So I'll give you the instructions for the meditation, then we'll try it for some time. Back to the breath. Breathing in and breathing out. We are asked to notice that breathing in, the sound is ha. Associate the sound ha with the breathing in, mentally. And breathing out, associate the sound sa. Try to hear it as sa. Breathing in, ha. Breathing out, sa. This is the hamsa. Hamsa. So ham, hamsa are the same thing. When you say sa first, that, and then ham, I, that I am, it becomes so ham. If you reverse it, I am that, that is hamsa. So breathing in, ha. Breathing out, sa. What does it mean? I am that. I am Shiva. Hamsa. Then notice that as we breathe in, follow the breath with the mind through the nose and the throat and the chest up to the middle of the chest as you breathe in. It goes in there and merges in the middle of the chest. This place where it merges, the breath, breath seems to enter into this place here. This is called Hridayam, the heart. Not the physical heart, the center of the chest, where the breath seems to merge. If you follow it, you will feel distinctly. It's going in. Your tummy will expand, it will go in, and kind of psychic energy stops here. Follow it with your mind. This place is the um, hum. Ha comes to an end here. This is the heart. This is the space of Shiva. Heart is the space of Shiva. What is the space? Distance, 12 fingers. If you, if you follow like this, from here, 10 plus 2 more, you will see. You will see the breath feels it, it's ending here. Inside your heart. Dwa dasha. Dasha means 10. Dwa means 2. 10 and 2. 10 and 2 more fingers. Inside the chest, it ends there. 
her. And as you breathe out, sir, through your nose, it goes out and the air which we are breathing out merges into the atmosphere at a distance of approximately 12 fingers outside. 10 here and 2 here, somewhere here. If you follow it, it becomes faint, subtler and subtler and then becomes indistinguishable, indistinguishable from the surrounding atmosphere. And the prana merges in the vayu. Breathing out is called prana. Breathing in, called apana. Lot of terms. Don't worry. Kashmiri Shaivism is like that. All you need to remember is her. Mm. Stops. Again, it emerges from there. Sa stops and again it comes back. That emerging, coming back, you let nature do it. Don't do anything yourself. It's happening all the time. We are just drawing attention to it now. All this time since our birth we were doing, we never knew it was her and Sa and Shiva. And the external space is the space here. The twelve fingers outside is the space of Shakti. So it's Shakti from which the Ha emerges. And it becomes, comes inside and stops here at the space of Shiva. Shiva. Shakti meets Shiva here. The vibration of Shakti and Shiva here is I. It's called Aham Vimarsha, the I consciousness in the space of Shiva inside. And from there it emerges as the out breath. Sa. And merges into the space of Shakti. The space of Shakti and the space of Shiva in, outside and inside the chest, 12 fingers, are not different spaces. It's only because of our identification with this cage of flesh and blood that it seems to be inside and outside. It's exactly the same space. Shakti, Shiva, Ha, Am, that stops here, Hum, Sa. As it comes in, follow it. See, earlier we were in the Buddhist meditation, we're staying here. Now, we are following it. From 12 fingers outside, we, you are breathing it in, into that, that point. And stop. From there, sa. Breathe it out to 12 fingers outside. First, inside, ha. Huh? Don't say it, mentally only. Physically, if you say it physically, what will happen is breath will go out. Anytime we speak, breathe, you're breathing out. So you just follow the breath and mentally say, uh, and mentally, the her uh will be prolonged as long as the in-breath lasts, naturally. Uh, um. It ends with an um here. And then when you feel like breathing out automatically, after a second, sa, out into the atmosphere. Twelve finger uh, breaths here. No. At the ha, there's an M. Inside, there's an M. Outside, nothing else. It is ha, um, then sa. That M. Now, so the mantra is hamsa. It's called the hamsa mantra. Yes, another point. It is called the Ajapa Gayatri. The greatest mantra in Hinduism is the Gayatri mantra, Om Bhur Bhuva Swap, Tat Savitur Varanyam, and so on. All the Brahmin uh, boys are initiated into it when they get their Upanayana. That you have to do. It's a mantra to be chanted. Swami Vivekananda quoted it in his Parliament of Religion lectures uh, that every day in the morning we, we meditate upon that divine effulgence. May it, may it, the sun is the symbol, effulgence is consciousness. May it illumine our minds. It's a mantra that's chanted by. Uh, millions of Hindus. But that you have, that Gayatri, you have to chant it. This is the natural Gayatri. Ajapa means without effort, without doing Japa, it is continuing. Kabir Das sings. Kabir Das sings. I do not need to repeat the name of God. God repeats his own name. I sit and listen. What is he listening to? Hamsa. Hamsa. 21,600 times a day. God is repeating his own name. You just sit and listen. All that you have to do is listen. Hamsa, going on. Hamsa. Mentally, don't say it. Hamsa mantra is going on. 
you're inhaling, just keep your mouth closed. You're inhaling through your nose only. Just normal. Exactly the way we... At first it'll feel a little artificial because we are now paying attention to it. But we have been doing it since our birth, the first breath we drew after we were born. From that time till the last breath we drew. It is Hamsa Mantra going on naturally. Breathing in, breathing out. Breathing in, breathing out. Yes, that's the thing to imagine. Usually, if you breathe too hard, you're running and then you're, you'll breathe more than 12 finger breaths out and the air will be projected more. If it becomes lower and lower, slower, it'll be less, feebler. But imagine it's coming from 12 finger breaths from here. I'm drawing it up from here. This is the space of Shakti. Shakti alone is vibrating up to here. And from here, this hung, it ends here. Um, and from there, sa. Okay. This is the vibration of the Divine Mother, and all of the universe is created by this vibration. The Hamsa Mantra is the creation of the universe. Huh? Yes. We will take the question. So just uh, hold on to the. Okay, th tell me the question. I'll repeat it. Okay, very good question. Do we focus on the M? I was going there, but you're all on your game today. You're pointing out exactly what I'm, I wanted to say. Yes. As we follow the ha, we are, our mind is moving from here to here, following the breath. And mentally, what are you repeating? Not repeating, following one ha, not, not ha 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 ha. Just one ha, it goes and comes here and ends with the mm, hum. The split second, not more than that, when the in-breath has ended and the out-breath has not started. In-breath has ended, out-breath has not started. The ha has ended and the sa has not started. That is the space of Shiva. That is the space to realize I am Shiva. Most important, this is the inner secret of the mantra. The real mantra is that silence. When the sa ends with the, the ha ends with the m, mm, and the sa has not begun, that is the space of no breath, no thought, awareness only. At that point, you realize I am awareness for one second. When the urge comes to breathe out, then you start sa. And don't do that anymore at this point. Just wait for the breath to come in again. Uh, mm, one second. No breath, no thought. Awareness only. I am Shiva. By that time, already the out breath will start. So, as you can see, a lot of homework is there. It will keep you very busy. Hmm. All right. Let's take one or two questions, and then we'll practice. Um, from the Zoom audience, are there any questions? Yes. Question from Abhijit. In Vedanta, there is the triad of God, World, Jiva, and underlying these three is Brahman. The triad seems to map into the trika of Shiva, Shakti, and Nara. In Kashmir Shaivism, is there an underlying absolute reality? Is there? Is there an underlying absolute reality similar to Brahman in Advaita? Yes. The underlying absolute reality is Shiva. And the triad here is different from the triad in Advaita Vedanta. Remember, the triad in Advaita Vedanta is not real. The triad in Advaita Vedanta is Ishwara, Jagat, Jiva. Their Jagat is false. The world in Advaita Vedanta is an appearance, it's a projection of Maya. It's not real. Ishwara is really none other than, the Saguna Ishwara is none other than the Nirguna Brahman, ultimately. And you, the Jiva, who are you? You are Brahman, not a Jiva. And this entire projection is due to Maya. It's an important point, I forgot to mention. Very big difference between Kashmiri Shaivism and Advaita Vedanta, very big. In Kashmiri Shaivism, the world is real. This world which we are seeing is real. As we see it, only we are seeing it in ignorance of the Shiva nature. And when we see it as Shiva nature, it is still real. We're seeing it in its absolute Shiva nature. Creation of the projection, projected universe is real in Kashmiri Shaivism. Why? Because Vimarsha Shakti is real. The self-awareness is real. And the power of 
knowledge, desire, and action. They are all real powers. So Shiva has real powers which projects a real universe. The real universe is, is they, have, they have a term called, I've got, I haven't gone into that, Spanda. In, in Vedanta, it is Maya, name and form only. The only reality is Brahman. Everything else is dependent. It's a name and form. Just a thin layer of appearance. But in Kashmir Shaivism, it's real. But its reality is Shiva. So the underlying reality, when I say underlying reality, what overlies it is also real. And what underlies it is the absolute reality of Shiva. And that has to be realized. Vigyana Bhairava. Yes, you can relate it to, the question was why you call it Vigyana Bhairava. You can relate it to Sri Ramakrishna's Vigyana doctrine. Uh, Sri Ramakrishna, again and again you will see that he says, the Lord has become, become this universe. Tini Shabhuachan, the Lord has become all sentient beings and in sentient matter, all the principles of this universe is none other than God. God has become all of this. Advaita Vedanta would tweak that statement and say God is appearing, Brahman is appearing as this universe. But Sri Ramakrishna does not use that language, language of appearance. In fact, somebody asked him, is the world false? Mithya. He said, why should it be false? It is, that is a process of, he says, viveka, vichara. It's a process of inquiry. In the process of inquiry, you take it to be false, to discover the reality. But after you re discover the reality, it is all God. That matches a lot with Kashmiri Shaivism. So yes, underlying reality is Shiva, but underlying the word should be carefully understood. It is not in the sense of a false universe underlying reality Shiva. No, Shiva alone and Shiva alone appearing as his own universe. Good question. This is a big difference between Kashmiri Shaivism and Advaita. The next question is from Harpreet. Yes. I understand that Kashmiri Shaivism describes the nature of ultimate reality as vibrations. Is that true? And is it part of the Pratyabhigya philosophy? Correct. Kashmiri Shaivism, I did not enter into that. How does Shiva become this universe? The Shiva has a power, Vimarsha, the power of self-awareness. So, all right, then what? This Vimarsha Shakti, the Divine Mother, is of the nature of vibration. So, there's a whole text called Spandakarika, verses on vibration. So, there's this whole vibration theory about uh, in, in Kashmiri Shaivism, which is not at all there in Advaita Vedanta. Advaita Vedanta is an appearance theory, reality and appearance, truth and false, satya mithya. But here, vibration, what is the definition of vibration? They say, ishat chalane, it is the same and yet it changes a little bit. You can see why it would raise heckles in uh, the heckles of Advaita philosophers. What do you mean a little bit? Either it is changeless or it changes. If it changes, then it is subject to birth, growth, death, decay. So, but in, in Kashmiri Shaivism, there's a whole theory of Spanda. There's a textbook called Spanda Karika. Just like this, Vigyana Bhairava. The entire universe is a vibration of the Divine Mother. The verse which we read just now, I did not touch upon that. It says, this breath is the vibration of the Divine Mother. This Hamsa is the vibration of the Divine Mother. Ha and Sa. This is the vibration. And the important point to note is the mm at the. So, attention to the ha, attention to the mm, stop there. One second, two seconds, and then sa. Don't strain. Question Are there meditations or inquiry techniques in Kashmir Shaivism which are similar to the Avasthatraya Vichara in Vedanta? Um, there are so many. There are some dealing with dream, using the dream. But not exactly like the Avastatraya Vichara of uh, Advaita Vedanta. All of these are almost like tricking the mind into enlightenment. Give you a support, like the breath, and then point you towards the reality. Another one is sound. So they say, Follow a sound till it disappears. Merge your mind in the sound till it disappears. 
your mind disappears along with it when the sound merges, at least for a few seconds. See, the thing is, we can't make our minds disappear completely. You need yogic samadhi for that, which takes years and years of discipline. But for a few seconds we can. And at that moment when the mind merges away into the sound and the sound fades away, you realize the awareness of the absence of sound, absence of mind. We can do that right now, you can try it. I will do it three times. This bell is very useful, this bowl. I will ring the bowl as the sound comes. Is the sound audible to everybody? As the sound fades away, it lasts a long time. Try to merge your mind in that sound. That means fill your mind with that sound. As the sound becomes fainter and fainter and fainter, mind also becomes fainter and fainter and fainter. Till it dies away into absolute silence. Silence of sound, silence of mind, awareness alone. Don't think awareness alone. Just awareness. You are there. Because after all, who is noting the absence of sound? Who is noting the absence of mind? You the awareness. But the sound will not, the, the mind will not remain like that. It will start vibrating again. Again the sound will be there. We will do it three times. The most important thing is the silence at the end of the sound, which is very faint. Let the mind also become very faint at that point and try to see that I am the witness of the absence of mind. All right. Close your eyes. Breathe in and out. Relax. Sit in your posture, body straight, hands on knees or your lap, relaxed. Now, listen carefully to the sound. Fill your mind with the sound as the sound drains away into silence. Let the mind also fade away. Note the silence. Again the sound will be there three times. Gently open your eyes. That light, that awareness, which noted the sound, the mind filled with the sound, the gradual disappearance of the sound, the gradual quietening of the mind, that awareness in itself is always there. Even in the midst of our daily activities, that's what we are basically. All right, now to coming back to our Meditation. Is there any more? One more question? Yeah. So we'll take one from there and one from Rama, and then come to the meditation. Um, it is actually a request to repeat the Trishul analogy. Oh yes. So Bhairava has Trishula, trident, Jnana, Ichha, Kriya. So the. Uh, Knowledge, not consciousness in itself, but the ability to know things, that knowledge which we have in a very limited sense, infinite sense, Bhairava or Shiva has that knowledge, or God, what we normally call in religion, omniscience of God. Then Icha, the desire of the will, 
So I said Kriya was will, but actually Ichha is desire or will. Kriya is the power to do, execute. So the will or the desire. And then Kriya, action, the power to do. To know, will, and to do. Yes. Jnana, Ichha, Kriya. The three uh, prongs of the trident. That's the meaning of the trident. The trident of the Bhairava. Swami, I had a question about the Ichha part. You hmm. said that in, in the Jnana Bhairava that it's all Shiva's desire. Desire or play. Play of Shiva. Yeah. So in that context, what does a Jiva do to get rid of desires? Is that something that is proposed in... Yes. So I'll repeat the question. The question is, so the knowledge, desire, and action, the three prongs of the trident, three powers of Shiva, we all have it. We all have knowledge, the knowledge which we have right now. We all have desires, and we all have the power of action. But in our case, they are very stunted, very limited. Um, our uh, desires far exceed our uh, power of action. Our will, will is feeble. And there's always a limit to which we can satisfy our desires. And by that, we do not get to full satisfaction. So, uh, it is to, at the level of the, of the jiva, what we should do is desire enlightenment. Give up worldly desires. In, in all spiritual practices, that is absolutely, it has, it has, it's mandatory. We give that up, and uh, our desires are directed towards Shiva. At the Arnava Upaya, at the basic preliminary practices, bhakti, great devotion to Divine Mother is taught. So Kashmiri Shaivas are actually great devotees of the Divine Mother. Power of love and worldly desires are the same thing. That which is directed into worldly desire, if it's collected and focused on God, becomes the bhakti or power of love. All right. Now, let us practice for a short while. We have run out of time almost, 10 minutes. Not the bell. The bell will signify the beginning of the practice. Remember, hamsa. Ha is breathing in, starting from about here. Follow the breath in and let, it, let your mind come to rest here. Mm. As long as naturally the breath is quiet for one second or two seconds, and then the sir begins. In your mind only, the sir begins out breath. Follow it out from your lungs into the air outside, into that space, 12 finger widths here. And then the in-breath will begin again. This is the place of Shakti, inside is the place of Shiva. Follow the breath, pay special attention to the Split second, careful not to miss that. And that is the point of aham vimarsha, the point of eye consciousness, the point of realization of enlightenment. Uh, one teacher said, the real meaning of hamsa is that point. So one should concentrate on that point. Wait for it to come, it will last only for about a second, and then it will go away into the out breath again. Sa. I will ring the bell for beginning and ring the bell at the end. Only 10 minutes. Sit straight, close your eyes. Oh, we have already got the bell. <laughs> so we'll do five minutes.
gently open your eyes, looking down into your lap or your feet. When you're comfortable, slowly raise your eyes. Let me end with a meaningful but uh, funny anecdote. Ashtavakra, whom we are familiar with, we'll meet again tomorrow. So there's a story about Ashtavakra and Janaka. So they are quite the pair. <laughs> so the Emperor Janaka and the sage Ashtavakra. See, the point of this Soham Mantra or Hamsa Mantra is to meditate on the meaning of that, not to use it as a mantra. We must begin as a mantra, breath and mantra we are beginning, but ultimately it's the meaning that I am that. That's what we are trying to contemplate. Um, the mantra, breathing, it's, that's the first stage. Associating it with the ha and the sa is the next stage. And then the mm, that is even deeper. But there the meaning should come. I am the consciousness watching that, that no breath, no mind state. Um, so the story goes that Asht um, Janaka, who was very inspired by this Hamsa mantra, Soham mantra, he started to practice it. So he would go daily, he can sit near the river, Hudson River, you can sit there and repeat the, the Soham. The same Hamsa, but as Soham. I am that. Hamsa means I am that. Soham means that I am. That I am. Soham, Soham, Soham. Ashtavakra happened to go by one day. So his friend and disciple sitting there, the king chanting, that I am, that I am, Soham, Soham, Soham. Then Ashtavakra sat down next to him. And in order to teach him a lesson. Now Ashtavakra had a water pot, the monks carry out, it's called a kamandalu. Kamandalu is a water pot. So he had a water pot, he put it down. And you can imagine Janaka sitting there, that I am, and looking at Ashtavakra sitting close to him, who sidles up close to him and puts his water pot down. That I am, that I am. And Ashtavakra chants, my water pot, this is my water pot. That I am, this is my water pot. That I am, this is my water pot. That I am, this is my water pot. And Janaka looks like this, had, gets irritated and he says, what are you doing? And uh, Ashtavakra said, what are you doing? I am chanting uh, the great practice of Hamsa Mantra, so, uh, so hum, I am that. I am chanting, I am that, or that I am. So I am also chanting, this is my water pot. Whoever disputes that it is your water pot, what a silly thing to say. Rashtavakra said, precisely, whoever disputes that you are Brahman, why do you have to say that? <laughs> so that's to take Janaka to the next level. Mm -hmm. We must start at our level, but remember, that's the goal. Where it's an undisputed fact, not even to be said, that I am Brahman, it's what else could be true? That this is Shiva shining forth, light shining, prakasham prakashate, and that's what I am. But of course, this is not to uh, dismiss the practice. Start with the breath, associate ha and sa with it, focus on the um, notice the silence, the quiet of the quietness of the breath, the quietness of the mind, witness consciousness. I am that till it becomes natural in every action. Yes, last question. Cycle, yeah. I can, I can use the both gap. You can, but then the attention will shift from the, actually the space of Shiva is the space of realization. So the Hridaya, the heart is the space of realization. That's why the focus is more here rather than this space. It should not make any difference, but we are so body conscious, it makes a difference for us. Because we think I am this body. So inside the body there, that space is where the breath stops for a second. And um, that one. Just as an aside here, one little point. Oh, the question he asked was, the spa space, the space uh, outside is also the space where the breath stops. So why not concentrate there also? You can, but I, as I replied, the space inside the heart, that's called the Hridayam, and that's the space of, taken to be the space of enlightenment. So real focus should be there. But one more thing, very interesting, Do this. I can do it here also. 
Notice this. Soham. Hamsa, soham is the same thing. Hamsa, uh, I am that. Soham, that I am. So if I write it like this. What strikes you? <laughs> Om. <laughs> yes. The meaning of Soham is actually Om. In the Matrika, the science of the letters, they say that actually you have to drop the Sa and the Ha. The real meaning of Soham is Om. And the meaning at the end, the M mm at the here, is the same thing which you learnt in the, in the Mandukya. The A, U, Ma and the silence beyond that, that's the heart. They have just, notice what they have done. That same philosophy, they have just tagged it with the breath. That's all. Uh, to think that waking, dreaming, deep sleep, I am the witness of that, the mind will flicker and go to a hundred different things. They have anchored the mind to the breath, to this continuous cycle. Uh, even if you anchor it to the no nostrils, your mind may wander. But here, you are kept so busy. It's like keeping a little kid with lots of things, keep, keep them busy. So you have the breathing in, which is continuous, and you associate it with the ha. And then the little gap, that also you fill up, and there you're told, that's the most important thing. Don't let the mind wander there. That's the most important thing. That's the um, and the silence beyond that, and the witness consciousness. And very soon, the out breath begins. You can't hold the breath. It'll uh, it begin again, and that is the sa. Uh, and then this. So your mind is, pegged to it, as it were. And it, it's quite easy. It's, it's not very difficult. You can, and you can keep it up for a long time also. Uh, uh, yes, that would be the last question. Kabir Das, remember, one more there. Kabir Das, remember, God sings his own name. I don't have to do anything. I just sit and listen. Very important instruction. The less effort you give into this, remember it's going on, it has been going on from birth till our meditation session now without our knowing about it. I, said, I didn't know all of this was there in the breathing in and breathing out. Yes, it's all packed in there. So, as it was effortlessly going on from birth till now, in the meditation practice also it should go on effortlessly. The more effortless it is, the more relaxed and lazy you are. Just you have to listen. God is singing his own name. Uh, Hamsa, Hamsa is going on. All right. Yes. Yes, that is true. Um, breathing in is the Shakti. Ha. It starts from the point of Shakti, and the vibration of Shakti is that which makes Shiva into Jiva. So this is called Apana Vayu, and this is the term Apana by breathing in. So it is the entry of Shiva into yourself, into this form as Jiva. There's a philosophy behind it also. So <laughs> I become the Jiva because of the vibration of Shakti. That one is Shakti, the Ha. And coming to the point of Shiva, it merges into the point of Shiva inside. From there becomes Sa, that is the vibration of Shiva, uh, uh, emerging out into the vastness, merging with the point where it becomes Shakti again, and so on in a continuous cycle. So Sa means Shiva, correct. And Ha means uh, Shakti. Ha also means I, the individual. Actually, I, the individual, comes in the meeting point of Shiva and Shakti, here. Yeah. But that has to be recognized. I am that meeting point. I am the vibration of Shiva and Shakti. Yes. It is passive. No, it is said to be the, uh, another thing, Ajapa Gayatri, it is the Gayatri which goes on without any effort. It is the Pranayama which goes on without effort. Pranayama with effort we will see in the afternoon session. But Pranayama, natural Pranayama, so the yoga people when they're doing Pranayama uh, in the basement below, they're doing it with effort. There's a technique. Here it's the natural Pranayama of the cosmos. Don't, don't put anything here. Let, let the, if the in-breath is long, let it be long. And if the gap between the breaths is short or long, let it be short or long. You just notice. It's God's job to keep this happening. Shiva's job and Shakti's job to keep this happening. It's actually Shakti's job to keep this happening. And as long as it's happening, we can listen. If you don't do anything, you'll find it's quite hard not to do anything. 
<laughs> we immediately want to intervene. We want to make the breathing nice and long. We want to make the gaps longer. I can meditate in the silence. Uh, it's difficult. Let it be and stay there with it. Yeah. All right. Let me do our Shanti Mantra. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Rupa Namastu